That was the voice of God is pleased at Freedom Conference. If there was ever a better transition, I'm going to go ahead and act like I planned that whole entire ordeal. Because, Danielle, show this first picture, all right? Can everybody see that graphic? So I'll give you an idea of kind of what we did for Freedom Conferences. I, we had no idea how many people was going to show up, who was going to show up. So I made an Excel sheet of every church in Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda, and I just cold called them all. Left voicemails, dropped off flyers at some churches. Well, this is a pastor that had texted me back, and this is about a couple weeks ago, he said, I'm in a meeting when I called him. So I said, no problem calling about a young adult ministry, call me back. He called me back, and uh, they were pretty interested. I don't know if anybody from, from there is here tonight. And uh, so I called him this week. I thought, you know, hey, people are busy. I want to call and get back in touch with people this week to follow up, make sure they're there on Friday night. So while I call, he doesn't answer and sends a quick text message back that says I'm driving. At the same time, my wife sent me a text message of three kissy faces. So me thinking I'm replying back to her sent three kissy faces back to her. <laughs> Except it was the pastor of a church here in Port Chart. Like, I, if, if there's nobody from that church here tonight, that's why. All right? <laughs> true story, true story. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're going to, you guys want to go ahead and pray with me tonight before we get going. God, we just, we thank you for bringing us all here together. We know it, it was not by accident, and whether we wanted to be here tonight or not, whether somebody forced us to come, you planned, you, you knew we would be here before the earth was created, and we thank you for that, and we just ask that these words not be something that we just forget um, something that goes in one ear and out the other tonight, but that whatever has been said tonight would just transform our hearts and just, uh, just help us not forget it. We ask that in your name. Amen. I'm going to read that. I'm going to stay in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, if you're looking at your Bible. Um, chapter 12, 1 through 2. I'm going to go ahead and read 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. But before we can get into those verses and dissect what those verses mean, we have to understand the very first word of that entire paragraph because it points back to something in the previous chapter. So I wanted to, to explain this point of how we um, understand the word therefore. I thought, what better time in the Christmas season than to show one of the best movie scenes of all time? Okay. Okay, kid. Give it to me. Oh. Direct it. How many fingers am I holding up, Marv? Okay, kid. You want to throw bricks? Go ahead, throw another one. If you can't do any better than that, kid, you're going to lose. You got any more? Come on, Marv, get up. You don't have any more bricks. He's out of it. Um, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Let me get back up. What? Let me get back up. <laughs> that did it. Nobody throws bricks at me and gets away with it. Come on, Marv, get up. You go this way, I'm going around the back. All right. So... Is there anybody that has no idea what they just saw? Like, has anybody not seen that movie? I'm just curious. So, hey, guys, that's all right. That's all right. Jesus forgives. It's all right. It's all right. So, 
My point in saying that is if you had never seen that clip before, you'd be like, what the heck is going on? Is there a menacing kid running around randomly throwing bricks at random people walking down the street? But if you have seen that movie, you know those are two robbers coming after him because he's got a picture of them stealing from a toy store. So the same concept applies to the word therefore. We have to ask something to remember. You have to ask, what is therefore, therefore? Always to go back. So let's go back to Hebrews 11, 32 through 35. I'll read this. This is Hebrews 11, Hall of Fame of Faith. That's kind of the chapter. It's talking about all these people that had incredible faith in God. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war. They put up foreign armies to flight, and women received back their dead by resurrection. I'll tell you what, if that's what the Christian life is all about, if it's conquering kingdoms, if it's enforcing justice, if it's quenching the power of fire, we're going to have no shortage of church, church members. None. Like, we wouldn't be able to keep people out of here if that was the case. But unfortunately, I think for a lot of us, we can look at those verses and say, that's definitely not been my life. That's definitely not been my story. And I think if the Bible stopped there, it would be hard to, to trust that. But it doesn't stop there. Let's go to these next set of verses. And keep in mind, this is the same exact paragraph. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they may rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. In the skins of sheep and goats, that is not a fashion statement. That is homeless. They went about homeless wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So you notice what this tells us? In the same same paragraph you have, conquer kingdoms, enforce justice, escape the edge of the sword, it doesn't stop and just say, oh, and to some people this happened. It, it's the same paragraph It says some were tortured. Some were sawn in half. Same paragraph. And you know what that says? Is that success in the eyes of God is different than how we see success. It's different. And it's important tonight because we have a lot of young people that are serving in the church and hopefully have 50 more years of serving in the church. And, you know, I heard this. I actually read a tweet one time. A pastor shared this online. And it said one of the best pastors in the world is in China trying to keep his church physically alive. See, we see, in America especially, we see bigger is better. We think that automatically means success. But what we're seeing here is that success in the eyes of God is what happens in the heart through a life of faith, obedience, and love. It's not what our eyes see. And that's what these verses are saying. So let's go back 12. Now we're getting into 12. So now, now that we've seen these are great men and women of God, these men and women, they had faith. Here's what happened to them. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it's not saying like they're in an arena looking down on us. It's not what that means. It's saying, hey, since we have this written down of what happened to them, we look to them as inspiration of a faith life of how we should live. That's what that's saying. And it said, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Some of those people, they had worldly success. I think we'd all want to conquer kingdoms. Um, But I think the, the one common denominator, whether they were sawn in half or whether they conquered kingdoms, is that they all courageously followed God despite the circumstances and despite what happened to him. Let us lay also aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. So the Olympics were this summer. I don't know if if you guys probably watched any of the running or the swimming. The runners, they wear super light shoes. They wear super light, like, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to say tight clothing. 
They don't want anything to slow them down. Swimmers, they shave their arms, they shave their legs, they shave their chest. In incredible. They don't want anything to slow them down. That's what this is talking about. And it's saying take away anything unnecessary. And I want to point out that weight and sin, let us also lay aside every weight and sin, which means weight and sin are different. They're not the same thing. So, you know, we, we did a uh, small group. Uh, I lead the small group here at Freedom, and we had one topics we got into is gray areas. Gray areas that aren't necessarily sinful in the Bible, but do they help us? And I'll tell you what, I'm glad that topic is over. That was a tough one to talk about. Should Christians drink alcohol is one of those topics. It's a hard section to cover because it, it's hard. The Bible doesn't specifically say either way. Um, but an example I'll give is that, you know, it, I'm going to get up here and do the thing that they tell you not to talk about. Two things, not, never to talk about dinner table, politics and religion. And, but I thought with the election this year, you know, I always feel like, man, I'm just dying to give my opinion on social media. Here's what I think about this person and that. And you know what? My wife always tells me before I post, she says, does this help the church? Does this help the gospel? And I'll tell you what, it's a good thing she says that because 100% of the time, the answer is no. The only thing that helps is me. So I think we have to look and say, like, what are these things that are holding us back? Galatians 5, 7, let's read this. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So some of those things that we need to, some of that weight, who hindered you? It's people. And I'll tell you what, I, I'm glad that we got a lot of people here that are involved in small groups because I'll tell you what, if you want to grow, you need to be involved. It's good to have people that will hold you accountable. I'll tell you what, the best thing that ever happened to me is that I'm accountable to, um, actually now, after tonight, I'm accountable to more of you. But every Tuesday night, I'm accountable that I have to be prepared and I have to understand what I'm going to say because I've got 15 to 20 kids showing up every Tuesday night. And I'm accountable that I have to study the Bible every week because they're showing up. And that's been the best thing that's happened. Even when I have not wanted to study, it's forced me to study, and it's been the best thing that's ever happened for me. So you need to be plugged into a church. And I plugged in where you're at, guys. This is not about Freedom Bible Church. If you're not at a church, we'd love to have you. If you don't have a small group, we meet every Tuesday night at 730. You're welcome to come. But if you're in a small group, you need to be plugged in there because that's how you're going to grow. That's how it happens. You're going to have people to talk to, people to help you. That's why God brings us together, to help us grow. You know, I, was, uh, I ran cross country in seventh grade. Terrible idea, by the way. Never do that. And <laughs> terrible idea. I thought, I love basketball. I still love basketball this day. And I thought, you know, that'll help me. That'll be a great way to get in shape for basketball. I'll be in excellent shape running three miles. Horrible idea. Terrible. Well, anyway, me and my friend, we learned and figured out that if you did not finish in the top 10, the coach would not pick you to run in the away meets. We would only run in the home ones. So we weren't the best. We, you know, we wouldn't have finished in the top five, but we could have finished in the five to 10 range probably if we really tried. But we thought, you know, let's just finish 11th or 12th. Then we'll never have to go to these away meets and we'll stay at home. I mean, Run three miles, stay at home. Come on. <laughs> this was a brilliant idea until the coach said, the week we decided to try this, you know what, this week, we're going to give the people that don't get a chance to run the away meets, we're going to give them the opportunity to go run. Backfired. And you know what we were doing is, we were running aimlessly. Next verse is 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 26. It says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Basically, we're running to win. Like this, this game of life is hard. The Christian life is hard, but we're running to win. We have a purpose to what we're doing. We're fixated on Christ. Exactly what Nano said. I want to point out the word sin in this verse. It says, let us lay also aside every weight and sin, which clings so closely. Clings so closely. That phrase comes from a Greek word, euperistastos, meaning competitors coming at you from every direction. 
So sin in our lives is like we are running and we have people coming at us to take us out, to destroy us from every direction. That's what it's saying. And another translation refers to it as parasitic sins, sins that suck the life out of us. But, you know, I want to make it clear that a lot of us in here, we, we, and you're probably in it right now to where you feel like you're in a moment in your life where you always say, God, I'm never going to do that again, only the next day to do it again. God, I'm never going to do this again. I promise I will never do this again, only to do it again. But thankfully, the Bible doesn't leave us stranded of how to beat this sin. I'll read, uh, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And here's the answer. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So it's basically, you want to know how like, to beat sin? Become fixated on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's how it happens. And, you know, I think what's, what's important is that we have to understand that, like, to get our eyes off ourselves. If we're actually, if we actually think that I'm going to be able to do this by myself, we're like, we're wrong. We're not going to be able to do this. I'm going to go and tell you, you're never going to be able to do it. The only way is to keep your eyes on Jesus. And do you realize God knew everything you would ever do? He knew every single time you said, I'm not going to do this, God, only the next day to do it again. He knew you would do that and still loved you. He knew every past, present, future sin. He knew it, and he still loved you. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The founder means the leader, the chief. Basically means God saves us. It's not the other way around. He chose us. We're part of his family. And I'll tell you what, you know, I'm not, I'm not from here. And I'll tell you what, this was not the, the plan for my life. And I don't, I'm not a part of a ministry, but I'm saying like me standing up here on stage Talking to you about God and Hebrews was not in the plan for my life. My plan was hit a baseball, millions. That's it. That's it. From 18 to 22, that's all I cared about. And, but this is not my life. But I'm thinking like for a long time, I struggled with self-worth issues. And honestly, even to this day, sometimes when we play church softball, it creeps up on me about that. That sounds silly, but it does. And for a long time, I struggled with self-worth issues because I thought from six years old to 22, I spent all this time playing a game. And you know what? I got close, but I didn't make it. And I thought, I wasted all that time. Like, what's the point of that? But what I didn't realize, I'm not from here. I went to uh, Charlotte Stone Crabs field to look it out just because I'm a baseball fan still to this day. I saw a Freedom Bible Church billboard there. I show up to church, I meet a girl, get married, and now we're here. Like, this was not my plan. Like, I'm not from here, and I'm here. All that time I thought wasted on a field led me here tonight. Like, it it all mattered. And my point is that every good moment in your life, every bad moment, God is using to shape you. The master surgeon is using to shape you into the way he needs you to be so he can use you how he wants to use you. And, and, you know, I think, like, I, I don't want to be, I don't want that to be a kumbaya statement because I understand for some of us, like, really bad things have happened. At one of my best friends from high school six months ago, heroin overdose, like that. Like, it, some of us, really bad things have happened. So, but I'll say that God is not driving a, I've heard a pastor say this before, God's not out driving an ambulance. Like, he's not reacting to this stuff. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, my favorite verse in the Bible right here. If there's one to memorize, memorize this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Verse 2, looking to Jesus, go back to Hebrews here, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter. I want to focus on that word perfecter of our faith. You know what that means? I'm not perfect. The word perfecter means I'm not perfect. And, you know, maybe we should just, maybe we should, somebody call TMZ, somebody call Gawker, somebody call CNN, because we've got a bunch of sinners in this room that aren't perfect. That, the cross exposes us all, and this verse exposes us all as sinners. It says, we are perfectors. 
So Jesus had to come take our place. We are not, Jesus is the perfecter. We are not perfect is what it means. And, you know, I think the reason I brought that up is because I think in the church, it's, it's easy for us to put on a mask, to have church dialogue. It's easy for us to act like a Christian when we're at an event like this, like, better not cuss tonight, I'm at a Christian event. Like, it's just, like, it's just a lie. Like, for me to sit up here and act like I've got it all figured out, like, I mean, come on, you guys, do you realize when I'm studying, like, I had to use the table of contents. Like, I'm not going to hide that. Like, that's the truth. Like, do you realize I'm, I was way more concerned. I interviewed our pastor and the guy that started our church 25 years ago, and they said, when I asked them a question, they said, you know, in our early days, we weren't really concerned about numbers. And, like, I heard them, and I'm like, they, like, they genuinely believed it. But, like, for me, that's not that easy. So for me to sit up here and act like that's not a struggle for me, like, th- that's, a, that's a lie. It's evil. The point is, why act like we're all together? Like, guys, Jesus hung out with the sinners. He pointed them out. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going to your house. Why are we acting like we've got it all together? First commandment in the Bible is, you shall have no other gods before me. I fail that one all the time. Forget about the rest of the Ten Commandments. I can't even keep the first one. And that's the point is that the Ten Commandments were given like, to show us we can't keep them. We can't keep them. It's, it's, I, I think we, we worry about our image so much that we forget the whole idea of the gospel is that God is redeeming sinners. That's what it's about. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Basically, accomplishing God's will was greater to Jesus than the shame and the pain on the cross. It was worth it for him to do that, despite all the shame, all the pain. Galatians 1, 15 through 16. It's the last verse I've got tonight. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. I shared this in our Bible study recently because this is a fascinating verse. The writer of this verse is a guy named Paul. And if you don't know who Paul is before, he became Paul. Before he became a Christian, he was a guy named Saul. And he was part of, basically, the best way to put it is, this would be like a general in North Korea, a general in ISIS, a general in anybody that is against Christians. This is like, the guy in charge killing Christians. And here's what Paul's saying about Jesus. It says, But would he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Jesus was pleased, or God was pleased to reveal Jesus to Saul who later became Paul. If there is anybody in the entire Bible that God should have, whoops, a tree accidentally fell on you whoops, a tsunami came out of nowhere. It would have been this guy that was killing Christians, yet it says God was pleased to reveal his son to me. I think, in in closing, God doesn't love the iPhone 15 version of us. He doesn't love the, the Microsoft, whatever, like Windows 25 version of us. I'm not a Microsoft user. I had to think of how that one worked. But anyway, my point is that God does not love the future version of us that has the Bible memorized, that, that actually has any verses memorized, that understands what the Trinity is, that, that has our life all together. Like, that's not how it works. God loves us right now because he says to Paul, who killed Christians, was pleased to reveal his son to me. I want to end on this story. It's really good. It's about a popular song. Um, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard this song before. And it's a story about Helen Haworth Lamell was born in England in 1863. As a child, her family moved to America, and her singing ability became evident. She had a reputation as a beautiful singer. She was such a good singer, churches brought her in to do concerts. She later wrote over 500 hymns and poems, but in the middle of her life, 
She became blind, and her husband left her because she was blind. A friend, a missionary friend, gave her a track that later inspired the song that we still sing 100 years later. And you know what's interesting is this building we're in tonight, like, I think it's like 90 or 100 years old. That doesn't have, like, you're not in 90-year-old buildings very often. Like, this is pretty cool that we're here. And, you know, I was thinking tonight, like, this building could have stayed open this long, like, for one per- person to hear the gospel tonight. It could be still standing and survived a hurricane for one reason. And I thought, listen to this. Friend gave her this track that inspired a song we may have heard. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Some of you probably heard that song before. A hundred years later, churches are still singing that song, and it was written by a blind lady. And you have to wonder, did God use a blind lady to write that? Because she wasn't caught up in the things we see in this world. And her answer was, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That means when our eyes are on Jesus, when we're fixated, like Nando said, when we're obsessed with Jesus, the things of this world that bother us, the things that keep us anxious, the things that we chase after that are going to matter when we're dead, they they don't matter. They're dim. It says they're strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Last verse tonight says 2 Timothy 4-7. through We've got a long road ahead of us, hopefully. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's what we need to say at the end. We've got a long way to go. It's not going to be easy, guys. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that the Christian life is going to be easy. My journey here wasn't, but I'm going to say it's going to be worth it. And you're going to be more satisfied than you would have ever thought. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Keep going. Pray with me.